Aspen Wait. Educate. Okay, uh, this is an Aspen Wait Media production, and this is Paul Wait meets Sharon Cook. And uh, the best thing I can say, I actually said this um, in my GB Expo show on Friday, Sharon, about you. Um, and it's, uh, I think you are one of the few people who treats me like I treat a customer. There we are. Oh, so that's, um, thank you. Yeah, it's, it's, it's good, excellent customer service. So um, I'm interviewing Sharon because I've got to know Sharon fairly well over the last few months. Um, yeah. And um, I always gravitate to people with sort of similar values to myself and work ethic. And I thought, yeah. um, given given the, the state of the country and the need for all businesses to to secure good debt funding, but what could be better than listening to the mistress of debt herself, Miss Cook? <laughs> so you're very welcome. I quite, like, I quite like that title, actually. Thank you, Paul. Thanks for the nice introduction. <laughs> so let's go back to the very beginning when um, you were a little blob. So um, where 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 was uh, where where was uh, Sharon brought up? So I was brought up in South Devon in a place called Rickham, Mm -hmm. uh, which is on the most southern tip uh, of Devon. My dad was a shepherd, um, and so we had a rather lovely life of a mixture of farm, animals, um, agriculture, and beaches uh, as kids. So, yeah, it was lovely. Nice nice childhood, really. So he was presumably a, a shepherd of sheep. A shepherd of sheep, yes, indeed. Yep. It, the farm was, um, the farm at the time was owned by Lord and Lady um, and uh, the, the Jeffcots and it was brilliant. We just had a load of sheep. We had cows. We had arable, a uh, perfect, uh, perfect mixture of, of livestock and, and uh, an arable land just out there on the tip because it was a bit of a, a micro system out mm. there. So, it was, yeah, it was a lovely place to grow up, just happy, happy times. Yeah. Yeah. What, um, what led your father to go into shepherding? Oh, gosh. So he was born in uh, St. Germans in Cornwall, and Mm -hmm. uh, he worked on Port Elliot Farm. So with uh, Lord Elliot, it seems to work for all the lords and ladies, Mm. uh, with Lord Elliot. And it was, I think it was just something he could do, you know, as as a, as a young man who just fell into it and he loved it. And my dad's full of compassion um, and husbandry. And it gave him an education as well, Mm. because they sent him to college um to learn all about it and yeah he, that's how he fell into it really so did you live on an estate house or or was it your own house um at the time it was the estate house that we we lived in just at one of the farm cottage they called it a farm cottage um and then yeah that's we we lived in there um and when the farm sold and my dad had to go self-employed he was fortunate enough to be able to buy the buy the house at a very very good price um, as part of the severance package, which was lovely. So what do you think, um, being the daughter of a shepherd, how does that sort of help to form the Sharon Cook that's now the the, the business force you are today? Ah, it's a good question. Um, and I think very much farming seven, you know, 24-7. It, there's, no, there's no break. You can't no. just not turn up. You have to have dedication. You have to be out in all weathers. You don't moan. That's your job. That's what you do. And it is a huge part of your life. It, you live, it, it's, a, it's a vocation. It's not a job. Um, and it's a livelihood. So, uh, and you learn a lot of compassion. You learn, you learn about death fairly early. Um, and you learn that actually going that extra mile, doing that extra thing can be the difference between life and death for animals. And I think... That was always instilled into me. Work hard. You have to work hard. Never give up. Keep going because, you know, it, it, it's very important. It, you are these people's, uh, all the animals rely on you. So you can't just, can't just give up. Keep going. And, uh, and I, it, it's just love, you know. I loved being on the farm. I used to get woken up in the eve- at night because my dad might have needed a help helping hand with a ewe that uh, was struggling to mm-hmm. lamb. Yeah. I had I had smaller hands than him, <laughs> so <laughs> you know it's uh, it's an interesting interesting life and uh, and it's a very family orientated life too. So you're all there to support each other and you all pull your weight. You never get paid. <laughs> you know, you do all for love, all for love. But so I think that goes a long way to set set me where I am today. Mm-hmm. Um, Oh, yeah, that's what I would say. Uh, did did he get involved in the slaughter process as well? Um, yes, well, certainly with 
when we had turkeys um, <laughs> on the on the farm. I remember my dad tried to keep me away from a lot of that, and, and understandably. But I remember once my nasty older brother. Um, I was looking for my mum, and she was plucking turkeys in the in the barn with the other ladies, and uh, and my brother told me where she was and didn't tell me what she was doing so that was a, was a slight shock um and something that we you know we do as kids but uh, yeah we used to round the sheep up put them in the back of the van take them to the local slaughterhouse and you know it's important to understand start to finish really mm. so no it's interesting my um my uh my uncle uh bob had a big farm in um near near clumpton in a place called buck bickley mm. And uh, he always had these horrible geese. And I always remember as a, as a boy getting out of the car and these geese sort of attacking us, and I was dead scared of them. But um, the, the revenge was uh, Auntie Joan used to invite us all to, uh, to dinner on Boxing Day. And farmers are very interesting, aren't they? They don't have any sim- uh, sentimentality. That's the word I would use. And so uh, we'd sit down to this wonderful dinner and Auntie Joan would say, oh, this is Percy or... It's yeah. Lavinia or whatever, you know, because um, they all had names and, and they just don't think anything of it. Um, sorry, just, just sharing another um, childhood story with me is uh, my grandparents lived in West Somerset. I used to sit in the back garden uh, quite often and there's a slaughterhouse probably no more than 400 yards away. And I always remember terrible, the, the pigs squealing like bilio. Yeah, um, they make a hell of a noise. They, they, didn't half know what was happening to them, I can tell you. Uh, yeah. But I just say it's interesting because I think that sort of, that sort of um, helps to shape uh, one as a person, doesn't it, all those sort of experiences? It, absolutely, yeah. It, it just exposes you to different things, I guess, and, and not everybody has that opportunity to have that exposure, whether people think that exposure is good or bad. Um, but it certainly does shape you and knowing that, and sometimes knowing that your hard work and everything has put food on the table can mm-hmm. be quite important, especially when you, as, as, as a farm hand, wages weren't exactly, no. um, weren't exactly good. So, you know, you, you appreciated everything that was on the table. And of course, we had a, a nice garden where my mum and my dad would grow vegetables. So we were very self-sufficient as, as a family. So occasionally we would have, we had a, an old raven and lambing season was always a bit bit of an odd one so we'd have some lambs in the kitchen behind a fire guard who were just getting better because they might have been a bit sickly and they were being bottle fed in the bottom oven of the um of the raven which is the warming oven you might have a lamb in there with the door open but to breathe the warm air because they'd had pneumonia as an Mm -hmm. example and then you'd have one in the top oven cooking um, oh, lovely. <laughs> you know a bit of a leg a leg of lamb or something in the top of it. it was very confusing um, and I, I remember um yeah I didn't eat lamb for a while it's one of my favorite meats now but uh there was it went through a small small patch of my childhood where I refused to eat the lamb um but um yeah it's uh it, it is it just it's a learning experience every day is a learning experience on a farm and of course we had milking cows as well and and we had uh yeah we bred from the cows so there was lots of, yeah, lo- lots of experiences that people just wouldn't, you know, until you found yourself covered in a load of afterbirth from, you know, calving a cow, you haven't really lived, I'm going to say. <laughs> so what was, what was education like in South Devon? Uh, limited. I'm going to say very limited. Really? We didn't have a choice. We went, I went to Kingsbridge Community College. Well, it's now Kingsbridge Community College. It wasn't then. It's just called Kingsbridge School. So all spoken in, I went for primary school to start with because mm-hmm. that was the nearest one. That was a, at least half an hour away on the bus, really? school bus. So we had, yeah, we had to catch a school bus. So we had to walk to the school bus and then catch the school bus. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so from Stokenham, then we automatically had to go to Kit. It's just the nearest place to go. And that was at least half an hour, a bit more on the school bus, probably about three quarters of an hour on the school bus. But you couldn't go any further or else you'd never have time to yeah. learn anything or get home or anything like that. So, um, yeah, so it was uh, limited choices, I'm going to say, as, as a kid. What were your favourite subjects and why? Oh, I love sport because it was outside. So what? What um, you, did, you, did you play sport to a level? Did you play for yeah, school team? Yeah, I, I played for school team. Um, I played hockey for Devon uh, for many years. Oh, I can just see until, that. Yeah. Until I left school, <laughs> um, we we played in secondary school. We were the first uh, girls to play rugby. 
Um, really? Uh, yeah, and bring that oh, into well into school. Uh, that was really good. But yeah, we were, we were lucky. We had. Uh, an outdoor swimming pool, which was always at least minus 40 degrees. Yeah, I don't know one of those. <laughs> In the school. So we, we did all that. But our, school was, our schools were very proactive on sport. Love sport. Um, I loved history. Um, I loved English, reading. Just, just fabulous. Um, so I, I enjoyed school. I enjoyed my moments at school. I think they were, they were powerful. In fact, I even found my head girl badge. The other day. Oh, um, you're a head girl, were you? I just imagine you you uh, doling out yeah. the lines. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I was fortunate because I was I was also school I was school captain. I was um, oh. I captain I captain the hockey team, and I was very fortunate. I played uh, when I was young. I played for the first eleven, um, so I was probably two years. So where they were under eighteen, mm. I was I was sixteen. So um, I would I was. Had a lot of experience doing that, and uh, part of a team is quite important. Um, and that feeling of working together was always installed in us. So, yeah, I love school. I'd go back in a heartbeat. I think it's better, better than working. <laughs> yeah, I think we might come back to the sport thing later. So, um, did you go to university or or, or further higher education at all? No, I didn't actually. I didn't. Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do, Paul. That was the problem. Mm-hmm. I think. Our careers advice was, oh, you're a girl. You can be a nurse or a teacher. Mm-hmm. It's like, well, I don't want to be a nurse. And I don't want to be a teacher. So very, very limited. And I was very fortunate to get a lander job at the local vets uh, as a veterinary nurse. So oh, okay. um, a mixture between large and small animal practice. So I learned a lot there. I learned a huge amount and, and enjoyed my time there. Um, I then fell into a bit of a marketing role. What, in their practice or...? Not in the practice, no, uh, for a company called Big Bree Mint, nice family company, and they made medals and coins. Okay. Um, How did you get to get that then? Uh, I just knew the owners, and okay. they were looking to hire someone, and I felt that you know it was time for a change, um, as you do as a young person. Um, and I worked with them for about three years. And then my old... I used to work at Garrock Hotel. It was the only employment as a child that you could get, you know, mm. when you're 16 and school holidays and stuff. Um, and my old boss called me and said he was starting a business called Hotel Swap. And um, would I like to go and work with him? And it was basically allowing hoteliers to go and stay in each other's hotels without paying. So bartering, really, swapping. Um, mm. And we built that from scratch together. And that was quite fun. And then that got taken over. Um and that's sort of how my business career started. Did your mother have a sort of traditional, was she a traditional sort of stay-at-home mother? Um, well, yes, uh, she was indeed. But um, when you say traditional stay-at-home mum, I guess we were all working on the farm. So um, she was always there for us. So work-wise, she wasn't technically employed, I guess, but we were all the time on the farm working. So but always there, always there for us when we got home from school and uh cooking our dinners and things so looking after us cleaning our clothes yeah good mum would you say your parents were aspirational have they helped to shape who you are now um are they aspirational i think they were just very happy with their world i think being a farmer um you know that's they were happy with what they had they didn't want more um they were aspirational for us as children I think me and my brother, they wanted us to go and achieve and be happy. Happiness is a big key thing in our parents' world. And yeah, so they weren't particularly driven as parents, but they certainly made the best of everything that they had. So um, given that you were a bit of a, you know, queen of the town type kid, um, doesn't really sort of, doesn't, I don't really sort of get this picture of, you running around going to rave parties and um, attacking all the local boys. So, um, you know, what did what, what did what did young Sharon do for fun? Sort of, you know, from the age of fourteen to eighteen, did you go to discos? When did you discover boys? That sort of thing. Well, to be honest, I played sports. Um, Much and it better than blokes, it, I agree with you. Yeah. Yeah, but we lived in the middle of nowhere, so we had no public transport. Mm-hmm. We had we had nothing. We didn't even have a village pub. You know, so we we were quite sheltered for a lot of our lives so if you wanted to go out then your mum would have to drive you and your mum would have to pick you up um so it was (laughs) fairly limited as kids 
what we used to do. But I think once I became an adult and lived out on our own and, you know, went to so the So how old is that? So when, when, do, when does that, were you becoming an adult? What age is that? Uh, so it'd be about 19. So okay. 19, 20, sort of uh, said to mum, that's it, go and stand on my own two feet, mm-hmm. be an adult. And uh, got a flat and just, yeah, just enjoyed life, really. I always liked to dance. So uh, we also went to the nightclubs, went to Plymouth. Um, gosh, Plymouth, that was, uh, yeah. Did get a Union many Street, mo- yeah. Union Street, yeah, yeah. many moons ago. <laughs> That's how to grow up, isn't it? <laughs> oh, yeah. It does. It's, um, yeah it's, uh, I can see Drew's been there looking at his face. Yeah, Drew's got his sheepish look on. He's definitely been to Union Street. He's definitely been to Union Street, yeah. And, and then the new place there, I can't remember what it was called now, but like on the barbican sort of direction, and that all became cool and, and fun to go out in. And, yeah, just I think because I was part of the sports scene, rugby club and stuff like that, we did a lot more community-based um, part, you know, parties. So the village hall would have parties and... To have a disco at the hall and it would just be more community rather than technically going out and that that's all i really enjoyed those moments of uh, of my life just enjoying those bits what about music were your parents musical at all did you do they have the radio on or you know were yeah, there people my, they well, liked yeah absolutely my my dad loves music my dad's music mad um and always singing his shepherd money. sounds like a singing name shepherd. for a band well, doesn't I'm, it <laughs> I know. I don't think. I don't think you would. I think only the sheep would appreciate my dad singing. I don't okay. think anybody else would appreciate that. But so uh, musically, uh, listening to music was really big. My dad was a massive Donna Summer fan. Um, really? So we had a lot of that. Yeah, huge, huge Donna Summer. Good man. Fan. There you go. So um, yeah, absolutely. So we and always had music in the car. We always had music at home. Mum always had the radio on Radio Devon in the background. Um, all, all the time. There's always music around our house, so we're quite lucky. What was the first record you ever bought? Oh, that's a good question. What was the first record I ever bought? Yeah, I would have had to have gone. I would have had to have gone to like a proper record store for that. I can't remember what it was now. I'll think about it. I'll come back to you. So has has, has has there been a, a certain genre of music that you've liked over the years, or do you like all music? I like all music, but I'm a bit of a disco queen. Love a bit of disco. Feel mm. good music, right? Feel good. Just feel good music always makes you happy. Um, and anything you can sing along to, and I can't sing, so please mm. don't ask. Um, but anything that's just lifts you up is always good for me. So um, we have three uh, musical selections from Sharon today. And uh, yeah, no we're kicking judgment. off with um, the force that is Dolly Parton. So um, what, is it, is it, what is it about Dolly Parton and or the song 9 to 5 that you particularly like? I think Dolly Parton's a hugely inspirational woman. So somebody of her, her standing in, and fame, she has compassion and she does good with, with everything that she does. But she does things that we probably would never, ever know about. So she's... Um, She's just one. Of, she's a lifter upper. She's a person that will lift people, and and take people along rather than step on people. And I think that she has. She's definitely a good role model for any woman, any man, because I think she has a, a great compassion. And I love her music. She's just, just a brilliant country western. And Nine to Five is just a great song. Great movie as well. It's terrible nowadays, probably, but great movie. And I think. Um, being a woman in business, you know, I, I kind of resonate with, with some of the words. Um, not so much anymore, but certainly in the past. Oh, well, you're very much not a nine-to-five person, though, are you? No. I would have said. No. Nine-to-five doesn't really exist in our world. You've just got to do um, do all the work as, as it happens. And, and if it means you've got to work long hours or weekends to get something over the line for a client, that's the important part. So. Good stuff. So this is uh, Dolly Parton and nine-to-five. Oh, wait. I have to say, uh, Sharon, of all the people I've interviewed, you definitely get the top prize for the most enthusiastic singing along and generally moving to your song. <laughs> so, um, because I stand all the time, I run quite into, just like that. Just yeah, I just look like a mad woman. That's all. Uh. Why? Why do you stand all the time? What's, what's that all about? Uh, standing desk is obviously better for you. Um, oh, okay. uh, and I, I work. I work better. I think I think better when I move, um, and 
it gives me the option to move around and keep myself active. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's just good overall, I think, to stand. Although my legs get a bit tired. I'm not as young as I used to be, sadly. Not still playing hockey? No, no, I can't. Uh, I had a bit of an accident and uh, have ruined my back somewhat. So oh. I have four prolapsed discs, three in my neck and one in my lower back. So um, not so easy to play hockey anymore. So do, can you do any sport at all? Um, not sport, sport, uh, anything that's a too, too, but I do, I do a fitness class every day. I try to do half an hour to 45 minutes um, of something just to keep active with your brain and your body. So, and I walk, I, I have a dog, so we walk miles. Um, I haven't got any sheep then. You've resisted the temptation to get yourself some sheep. Oh, do you know, I'd kill for a small holding. But if you have Is a it? small holding, you probably probably can't work anymore. The moment you get, because your dedication and commitment would be to that. But yeah, I'd love to. I'd, I'd, I'd rescue every animal under the sun if I had a choice. Um, you. But um, yeah. Okay, so let's go back to young Sharon, who's um, discovered marketing. Uh, did you, did you um, receive any training or was it sort of um, school of life stuff? School of life stuff, I think, um, and understanding. And at the time, the internet was coming in a lot more, and we were just learning about that and getting, yeah, getting them online, getting them sales, and talking to people. And uh, I've always loved talking to people and, and having, you know, making relationships with people. So um, I, I did a lot of that, where I, I just built relationships with with purchasers. Um, shops and, and things like that, new things for them. So, yeah, that's that's kind of. I'm not a marketeer by trade, that is for sure. But that's what they wanted. They wanted to have this family feeling of of good relationships. So that was my job to do that. I guess coming from the background that you did, that was quite an achievement because presumably, um, you know, it was very small village. Um, you know, very inward looking sort of community. So how do you think you, how did you describe, because you're quite, um, I don't know how I'd put it, you're um, very personable and sort of comfortable talking, aren't you? So where does that all come from? And my mum, I think, my my mum is just, she she worked once we were older um, and very self-sufficient, um, so 16 plus. Um, she got a job at the Garrock Hotel just, um, and she ended up being the manager dress, which was amazing. She worked her way through. Um, so just that hospitality element, I guess, was built confidence. And because as kids, we worked at the hotel, we met lots and lots of different people, uh, different backgrounds, just, you know, people we were exposed to that we never would have seen just in our village on our own. So it was a really good learning experience. And, you know, waitressing, you meet a lot of people. Um, and especially in a in a hotel like the Garrock, where people stayed on site, they didn't really go very far. They mm. just... Um, they just were there so it was very much a, a community um, so you got to know people you had to talk to people and you'd be talking to high flyers and all sorts and you just get to know people's backgrounds a bit and it opened your eyes to, to what was available and what was out there and what people could do and lots of lovely people lots and lots of lovely people to meet so what was the what was the move after the marketing job so I went to hotel swap with uh, with Colin and. Um, that was a case of just getting the business off the ground. So launching it, getting uh, hotels to join the, you know, join the club and meet hoteliers and just try and get things moving and monetize, um, you know, you know, earn money from it to get people to commit. And, um, and they did. And then we opened it up a little bit more. Um, and it ended up being taken over by a company called Bartercard. I don't know if you. Yeah. Yeah. Heard of them, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so it ended up being taken over by them. Um, and at that point, I moved up to Sunbury to work with the Bartercard team. Oh, so they, so they sort of kept you on, did they? You were they, Yeah, they did. They invited me to go and work with them. They, they were, I'd obviously impressed them enough doing what I was doing, sort of organizing the travel side of everything that we did. Um, and they asked me to go and join their team. So I was young enough and I thought, why not? So how old were you then? The big uh, I was probably about 24, 25, something like that. So So that was the that was when you left Devon behind forever, was it? 
it was. Yes, I've never worked back in Devon since. Uh, obviously, been back there, but uh, yeah, never worked back there, and uh, uh, sort of learned a lot of business experience with Bartercard um, through the businesses I worked with. M- not necessarily through Bartercard, but the businesses I worked with, um, and the relationships and the clients. Um, I was very lucky with, with all that, so quite enjoyed it at the time. And that was a national role, Young, was it? Uh, no, in the end, it was a more of a localised role okay. in um, in Sunbury. Um, but you were dealing with, you were trying to deal with businesses within a certain radius so you could actually get the relationships with them and, and build build that. So that's what I, that was my background, really. That's where, where I herald from. Um, and that's my business experience. So I really learned a lot about understanding people's accounts, understanding how business worked. Um, getting to know business owners, understanding their, their challenges. Uh, their challenges were, you know, always quite big. Getting sales in, keeping staff, you know, all the challenges that businesses go through every single day I was exposed to. And um, and I learned a lot from all of my lovely clients there. And I stay in touch with quite a few of them, actually, uh, which is which is wonderful. What makes you do that? Or is it, is it a reciprocal thing? Uh, what, to stay in touch with the clients? Mm. Yeah, some were just jolly nice, um, <laughs> and <laughs> which is always always good. And um, uh, yeah, if pe- I think people just follow you around a bit, don't they? So LinkedIn is always really useful for people yeah, yeah. to understand. And um, and because my role now and what I do, some of the accountants uh, have come back to me to help their clients, um, and a, a few others I keep in touch with just in general. And they pick up the phone and say, "I've got a question. Can you can you help?" And because they know I will help. So, are you still uh, a rugby fan? Oh yeah, yes. That's what are you about four I, stops from Twickenham, aren't you? Uh, I, well, we're a bit further than that, but yeah, not too far from Twickenham because I'm in Buckinghamshire now. Um, no, I was thinking about Sunbury. That was not not Buckinghamshire. Um, oh no, Sunbury is where I used to live. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I was really close to Twickenham and yeah. uh, had good affiliations. I associate with, um, Sunbury with catching the train from Reading to Twickenham. You see. Ah, fair enough, fair enough. And uh, yeah, so I, I worked with the Harlequins and London Irish and people like that when I was in Bartercard. So yeah, I had a, I had a few, few good experiences and very fun experiences going to Twickenham, watching um, England, Australia, England, New Zealand. Um, yeah, just can't beat a bit of live rugby. Just love it. And of course, at the weekend is, um, not this weekend, but last weekend was the Six Nations. And that was a cracking, uh, cracking couple of games of rugby there. Really enjoyed it, um, and uh, yeah, even enjoyed watching Wales versus Ireland. So uh, Wales against Scotland, you mean? Uh, Scotland, sorry, yeah. And uh, <laughs> I can't remember what I was doing. Now. Where, who were we playing? Italy, weren't we? And then <laughs> we played Italy, um, and uh, yes, it was good. It was good. I enjoy enjoy watching it all. So it was all good fun. Do you follow ladies rugby at all? I will do. Yeah, I do watch some of it. It's not. It's just not on TV enough, I don't think. Um, I quite enjoy watching it. I, I certainly enjoy the international uh, matches when they're being aired. I, but t- it's all time, isn't it? Everything takes time out of your days. And we are, uh, sort of saying to someone the other day, we, you know, we live comfortable lives, but we are definitely time poor, at, you know, because we work so much. Um, but yeah, so it would be an ambition to work less and have more free time to do the things we love. Yeah, I don't, I don't like the work-life balance thing, but obviously, you know, the way I look at it, as you know, I, you know, I, I have a similar work ethic to you. But um, so, for instance, um, I always go to the gym on a Tuesday afternoon, and um, uh, it, it, nothing would force me not to do that. So no, no, yeah. no degree of peer pressure. Because that's one of the sad things about it is people, so people like you and me who work very hard do get put under pressure from people to, I find, um, you know, there's, there's like a guy I know at the moment who's always trying to drag me out for a beer. Uh, mm. And then you've got people whose who's way of working is completely different to yours. So I'm much more, um, you know, early start uh, and then sort of stop it in the afternoon, then pick it up in the evening a bit. And you get people sort of trying to dr- get you out to meetings on Saturday mornings and the evenings. So I think, you know, you've got to have some rules. So, yeah. you know, I would never, I would, so I, I would watch every England ladies rugby match, you know, um, I would yeah. never turn around and say, I can't do that because I'm too busy or something, you know. Mm-hmm. I think what's good about the yeah. ladies game is, um, 
is it's it's gone from if you watch rugby ladies rugby ten years ago, um, it was like um, how can I put it? It was like watching young boys playing rugby, you know, um, particularly when it came to kicking, for instance, you know, because um, women are obviously at a great physical disadvantage when it comes to kicking the ball, for instance. But if you look at the, I, I, I actually would say now that I think the the ladies rugby team player for player are more skillful than the men. I think I think they're beautiful to watch, and they're all athletes now. I think that's the difference. And you know, it's only I think it was last year. Yes, it was. I thought it could have even been this year. I think it was definitely last year that the Wales international team had become full. You know, they they could actually the ladies. Up their job. Yeah, that's right. Ladies, I mean, that's that's disgraceful, isn't it? You know, it, it, they so they had to run a job and be a national player. And, you know, they, it's just crazy that somebody can't, um, you know, couldn't be supported to do what they're, they're extremely good at. Um, and it's, so that's a good step in the right direction for, for, for the uh, international teams to be able to do that. But they, they do, they are athletes and they do have to play differently to men. Um, like you said, the physicality is, is a difference because I, I, I played rugby at school. So, you know, the physicality and when I left, it is so much different. And you you get really big. I'm I'm five foot four and a bit, you know, mm-hmm. and uh, I was a winger or a back. and But I could kick a ball. I had my hand-eye coordination. <laughs> so I could chip and kick. I would oh. get it through the, you know, so I can. And I still do it now. And people look at me when I sort of kick a ball sometimes. They so just drop kick it onto my foot and they, they go. And they well, during the middle of a business space, it must be quite dis- disconcerting for them. Yeah. <laughs> Is that worse <laughs> than me? I thought I was naughty. <laughs> it's a good way to settle an argument. Come on, let's go outside and drop kick a ball and see who wins that one. So- um, but, you know, yeah, so you do have to be more skillful. And I think you just have to work women especially have to work to their talents uh, yeah, and, and really uh, as the men do, you know, and just the, even the men's game, you look at it 20 years ago, it's nothing like it is today. Oh, no, no, nothing. No. No, I agree. You know. So um, how long did you spend um, at Bartercard in Sunbury? I spent quite some time there. I probably did in Bartercard in total about 10 years. Really? Hmm. Gosh. Yeah. Yeah, it was a long time and I moved about and, well, I didn't move about, but I did different things and I went and came back as a consultant for a while. So, yeah, I had, I had quite a good time there, but the management changed. So, um, you're only as good as your management team, I always think. So, so were you at Sunbury all this time? No, not all the time. So, mm. I went from Sunbury, then I went to head office into a bit more of a national Where role. Where was that? Um, in Slough at the time, oh, so it used to be in mm. Slough, and they moved to Slough. Yeah, so I did did a bit of work there. The old A four. Yeah, <laughs> oh, yeah, horrible place to get in and out of Slough. Yeah. But there we go. There we go. So, um, so what? Um, so is is Choice Business Loans the first business you've had where you've actually been the boss? Um. Well, I've been the boss of myself. So I, I had a, a consultancy called Fresh Eyes Consultant after Bartercard. Um, and I set up and I was doing work with basic, basically high net worth individuals um, and uh, helping them with feasibility studies. Um, so I was doing that and I did a bit of CSR as well, um, helping. Uh, it was a company called 4C. So that was quite enjoyable. It was quite good to give back, but they did also pay me for the role. Um, so I did that as part of the consultancy, um, but I was only the boss of me. And that's quite hard, just being the boss of you, because um, you're Why is that? very hard on myself. I'm very hard on myself. In what um, way? Well, I, I have high expectations of what I should be delivering, quite right too. how I should deliver things. Mm. Um, and yeah, constant pressure not to, not to let anyone down. And not to let myself down. So yeah, it, it, being a boss of you is quite hard. Um, and then I got offered a role at Choice Loans, and uh, took us a while to decide if I wanted to do it or not. Um, but I thought no, it's, it was interesting, and I wanted to get back into helping multiple businesses because mm-hmm. that's what I really missed was doing the multi business help. Um, and so I joined Choice Loans with Sean O'Farrell. And then I became, after five years, I became a director uh, and a shareholder. Okay. So I earned my stripes. Good. Earned my stripes. I think um, it's a good place to leave. I think we need to play some music. So um, 
Your next track is Blondie, One Way or Another. So um, what do you like about Blondie and this particular track? Uh, I love Blondie. She's just a force of nature. I, mm -hmm. I, would, I wanted to be her when I was a child. Mm. Beautiful, exciting, passionate. And this song is kind of, yeah, I'm going to get you one way or another. It's kind of how I feel about how I work for my clients. I'm, I'm going to get, I'm going to get the result for you one way or another. I'm going to get it done. And this is, uh, kind of resonates with me, this song. So I, um, I share your sentiments, but from an entirely different perspective. So when I was at university, um, Debbie Harry, uh, adorned all of my, uh, the, the wall above my bed. <laughs> so, uh, my, my, my intentions towards Miss Harry were very different to yours. I have to say. I, I um, imagine they were. <laughs> I imagine they were. <laughs> so this is, the wonderful Debbie Harry and Blondie in one way or another. Paul wait. I particularly like the uh, guitar instrumental in that. That's why I was I was uh, preparing yeah. for it. Um, I, I have to say, Sharon. So um, being you know being one to um, not say what he's thinking. If ever I saw a woman that should be doing a show on Aspen Weight Radio, it's you. Oh. I could just see you <laughs> having your own. Yeah, serious. I, I, yeah, so you need to think about that. And then you could Thank you, you could much. talk about. All sorts of interesting things about debt, finance, and factoring, whilst regaling mm. people about Dolly Parton's work ethic or something. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'd be too busy dancing around, though. That would be the problem. Too. No, it's good. It's, it's, good uh, it's always nice. It's always nice to see people who um, who aren't shy, should we say? That um, uh, it's, it's, it's always. I think one of the things that's, it's interesting about interviewing people is is you get to see uh, a different side to them or maybe a fuller side of them than mm. you normally would. Uh, one, the other thing I was thinking is if you'd said to me, right, what do you, I would have said, I would have put a lot of money on the fact that choice business loans and Sharon cook were almost like interlink, you know, it, it strictly be interlinked. So to me, you are choice business loans. So I'm actually really surprised that choice business loans existed before you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> a lot of people think that I think it's um, because of my personal work ethic I think when I do something I do it properly uh, I put myself behind it I, I couldn't possibly do a job that I didn't believe in I couldn't do something that didn't feel right and didn't feel like it was having an impact so um, I think when I first started at Choice Loans because I, I come from running my own business I just treated it like it was my own business oh. so ev everything I did was as I would have done it if it was mine <laughs> um and I think that's kind of where people think you know that it that it yeah it was all mine but it, it certainly isn't and, and Sean has done an amazing job building a business from you know from nothing and it started off as personal loans actually weirdly and then not when I was there, um, probably psych I couldn't do, but um, it's personal loans. And then it, with the emergence of this alternative wave of, uh, of lenders that came after the, the last crash that we had um, was, you know, was new and, and interesting. And he, he started delving into that. And I kind of joined him at that point where he was just getting into it, you know, so it, we, we could grow that together. Um, he's a very technical, very detailed man. So he was pulling together very good systems. He was putting together all the information in the right way. And with my creativity and the way that I operate with people and network and, and think that actually having partnerships, Paul, like you and I have, is so valuable to have those partnerships and that trusting relationship and they take time to build mm -hmm. so whilst sean was building the technical bit in the background which doesn't really interest me i mm -hmm. was building the front end relationships and and that's where the two of us have just worked extremely well together we're, we're like brother and sister um we're very close in age um uh, we bicker a lot um and and we agree to disagree and we challenge each other all the time which i think is very important and we are poles apart personality wise um but have very much this moral streak that we both share and we have this this uh vision for the company and vision for how a broker should be um brokers have a bad name paul um they're sharky most of them they're not good um and in the past it, uh, please don't shoot me down other brokers out there in the past it has been very much a boys club 
you know, I, I remember going to a couple of events and just thinking, am I actually the only woman in this room? Mm -hmm. This is ridiculous. Um, it's changing. It's changed. And luckily the SCA has, and the NACFB, which is the National Association of Commercial Finance Brokers, have started to put a very robust framework in for, for how brokers should be working, how they should be treating their customers uh, and not just taking as much money as they can and doing a pretty shitty job, if I'm honest. Um, and it's very much more that that's a slow turn. But we've always put the customer first. The customer has to be in the forefront of our our life because if it's not right for you it's not right for me and that's the important part so how did you how did you go so you went into debt finance which is quite a skilled area you've obviously got lots of different products um all sorts of different asset finance conventional loans um how did you how did you get to learn your craft how did you so for instance i had quite a high level discussion with you last week um, about how much you could borrow from a self-invested pension plan, for instance. Yep. So how did you how did you get to have that knowledge? Um, where Sean had pulled together product information, we don't pull together product in information like other people. What we do is we kind of interview our lenders and we actually get under the skin of what they look for. Um, and we understand what they want to see in an application because that's really important. There's no point trying to bang around you know, round plug into a, a square hole. It's just not going to work. So we understand exactly what our lenders are looking for. We understand their parameters. Um, and really, it's just a learning thing. So we are very busy. So we do a lot of this all the time. Um, we have something called the Bible, which is all of our lender information. And when we're in the office, we have a huge, big product board that has the highlights of what we're looking for. And really, it's practice, 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 practice. And we start at, why doesn't somebody fit here? And we ask that question. So at the, high, at the top of our board is our cheapest, longest lenders that we would ever have. And the question is, why can't I put that, lend why can't I put that customer there? Where is the, that's the cheapest? What fails them going there? And then we start moving down the board until they fit. Um, because you can't, you, know, you can't change certain parts of, of a business. You can't change what a lender looks for and you can't change what a business has or does not have. Um, so things like, Home ownership can be really important for some lenders. They just won't look at you unless you're a homeowner. Um, and if you know that information, that you know that you know you can't take someone there. So and that's fine. Um, so that's it, it is a, a, a practice, a skill, and it is an interrogation of every single customer that comes to us as to we need all this information. We then interrogate the information and the financials, and then we try and match them to the most suitable lender. Um, and it's that process that we have in place that allows me to now answer everything off the top of my head, pretty much, I'm going to say. so. Yeah, it's a two-way process, though, isn't it? Because it's, it, it's like a marriage, because it's all very well having your lenders, but you need to understand um, which lender is appropriate for a certain type of business. And obviously, um, it's take uh, factoring or sales ledger finance, as I prefer to call it. Um, it, it it's, it's, it's still after all these years, it's still um, a, a product that's not really understood. And yeah. many people still sort of regard it as a sort of a leper product, maybe. Um, yeah, a distressed product. Yeah, a distressed product. Really the phrase. Um, yeah. So uh, I guess a lot of your job has to be sort of almost training, teaching, educating. Is that, is that right? Yeah, 100%, 100%. And I think things have moved on so much more and I think so factoring is a really interesting one because in the past if you use factoring then you probably had a cash flow challenge in your business but in the past people used to pay you in 30 days in the past you didn't have to wait 180 days for your big client to pay you and still demand that you supply the product on a regular basis so economics have changed and the way that businesses deal with other businesses has changed and the, and the power has shifted somewhat so you know where you do have customers that are demanding 60 90 120 days credit well that suddenly makes you the banker when did you become a banker for your customers but you know that's the question you have to ask so using a product like invoice finance just allows you to cycle your money through without going that peaks and troughs and when you get to the trough then you have to go and find money from somewhere else and it becomes very hard and it gives you sleepless nights as a business owner but you don't necessarily have to put your full book 
um, into invoice finance. So you might say as a, as a business, well, most of my clients pay me on 30 days. Fab. We like those clients. But what about the ones that don't? What about your big clients, the ones that demand that extra time? What mm. do you do about them? So you could just technically factor that one customer. So if you suddenly win a huge contract with a supermarket, it doesn't really matter yeah, yeah. whom, um, and they are they dictate the terms to you, not the other way around, as always, you can just factor that one customer. You don't need to do your whole book. Mm. But what that does is that allows you to keep your money coming back in to keep supplying that product to that customer. So you don't have to worry about where the, where the cash is coming from. Um, and what you're not doing is you're not putting that, whole thing on your whole book so actually you're limiting the cost to your business but some people don't know this is available and why would they it's not their job it's mine so it's uh, yes so what, does, what does a typical customer look like a typical customer for me is somebody who's trading uh who's making sales and is probably going through a growth stage okay. it is where where they're at um or they want to do something with their business so they want to invest in their business Maybe they need to do some capex, um, and they're looking to invest into upgrades of machinery. Um, and yeah, often often expansion. It's, I think now it, it, coming out of the um, coming out of COVID and coming out of the pandemic, I I deal with different businesses. So I'm either dealing with ones who are growing and having a great time, um, or, or I'm dealing with businesses that have have been closed and the money they got then at the time, the Sybils or the bounce back loan was really just a band aid. It really just filled a void. So normally when you borrow money, uh, you borrow money because you're going to do something like proactive. Yeah, yeah, no, you, yeah, have, I agree with that, yeah. you know, you would go to your accountant and you'd say, Hey, I need to do this with my business. And you would work out the cash flow forecast. You would check the return on investment. You would check that that is going to come back to you. But with the pandemic where it's just filled a hole, and nothing proactive has happened with that money. They now have to pay it back. So they're now paying back something that has not helped their business. It's helped get through the pandemic, but it hasn't physically helped their business proactively. Um, so I'm dealing with quite a few customers like that at the moment, where we, we're just having to put different things in place to help them now grow their business. So now they have to reinvest in their business um, because they're, they're coming out the other side. So it's slightly different. A uh, slightly different kettle of fish, a different customer, but uh, interesting. Do you not see a lot of distressed businesses? I see some, um, I, and we will see more this year. The challenge we have with the distressed business is they probably have no affordability and they've probably left it too late. And throwing money at a situation probably isn't the answer. Um, and in those situations, we would either advise to go back and talk to their accountant and get some proper professional advice um, to see how they can. Is it fixable? If it's not fixable, don't throw money at it because you're just going to get yourself into a bigger hole. But if, it, if you're working with like a professional like yourself, Paul, and you can see a way out, then there's something we could probably do to help that customer. But I'm never going to throw mo- get them to throw money at something without having that thought process. And thinking it through very carefully borrowing money is a big decision and it should it should repay you regardless of your situation uh, and if the business is too far if it's not savable then obviously we suggest that they go and talk to a, 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 a more of a specialist an IP, uh, yeah. Say, an IP yeah which is sad and you know I had a, a lady the other day who just wonderful and she has multiple businesses and she said this one business Sharon is is never going to come out of the other side of this pandemic and she had a bounce back loan in which she used for business purpose which is good that's a whole different story um and she said she didn't know what to do she couldn't reopen her business because she didn't have enough capital to restock (laughs) so um so I had to put her in touch with somebody just for that particular business that uh, that we discussed but the other businesses she could now concentrate on and move forward with. Um, never makes me happy to have those conversations. It always gives me a sad feeling. Yeah, of course. It's not what we want. Are there any products or new lenders that people ought to know about that um, you would recommend? Oh, so what is emerging, which I, I'm quite excited about, is e-commerce, e-commerce lending. So where uh, 
the pandemic has sort of forced people online and actually it's given people a new sales outlet. Um, and they say to me, if I just had more money, I could buy more stock, I could sell more stock and I could cycle it really quickly. So we've got some really cool lenders out there um, who will give you um, uh, advancement against your online platforms, all of them. So it could be anything from um, Amazon to eBay to anything, all the others, your own personal platform, whatever. Um, and they advance you for a fixed fee, advance you the money, and they take it as source then. Um, and then they can, you can keep cycling that. So you can buy your stock, sell it, buy your stock, sell it. Um, until you get to a point where you don't need it. But they have they add a little extra because what they do, a lot of them now, give you analytics on where your sales come from. So it's kind of a free marketing help for online businesses as, as part of the service. So that's quite interesting. A few good ones come in doing that. The other thing I'm seeing is an emergence of revolving credit lines. So basically think overdraft, not attached to your bank. So kind of... You can use it instead of invoice finance if you only have a very short period every single month or every couple of months where you have a cash flow dip. Mm -hmm. You can then dip into it, use it, cover that small thing and pay it back and then not pay anything else. So very much a pay-as-you-go uh, thing. And they can go up to like £5 million. Pounds. You know, so they can be some serious big lines of credit. Like you obviously have to be a seriously big business for that. Um, but, but, yeah, so we're seeing all these slightly quirky products come out and um we're seeing banks retract even though they say they're open for business mm. i think they are they're going to be a little cautious after the huge investment into the sybils and the bounce backs that were made and they did a great job you know they did a great job with getting that money out there so they, they were fantastic but there is consequence you know because it was given out quickly and fast which it should have been but sadly, there are some people that took uh, took advantage. Indeed. So, thank you, Sharon. Um, so, f how, how do, um, do people get in touch with you if they want some good, honest, quality advice? Um, so, they can either email me, uh, Sharon Cook at choicebusinessloans.co.uk, pop to our website, um, have a look on there. Hopefully, a new one will be up soon. Um, and... Uh, they could link in with me, so just find me on LinkedIn, uh, pretty easy to spot, um, or call me uh, on 01494 410125. Very good. So um, I'm going to play out today with a, a record which I think sort of um, typifies you really, which is um, Happy and Farrell Williams. So uh, I, don't, I don't, I think I know the answer. So why did you pick this? <laughs> just feel good, right? It just that you cannot. You cannot not smile at this song. You cannot dig in the car. You cannot not sing when you're driving to this song. It's just fabulously uplifting. So I hope it makes everyone's day. Sharon Cook, the home of happy business. So um, hope you enjoyed the chat with Sharon today. Um, you've more than exceeded expectations with your... Um, I'm, I'm very pleased to hear that you were a head girl and uh, you're so, so good at dancing while standing on your feet. So um, thank you, Sharon. <laughs> Aspen Wait. Educate.